We're out here today setting up a forest carnivore bait station for a multi-agency, multi-organization collaborative project. This uh, project is to train citizen scientists volunteers in how to set up these bait stations. If you use this video training for any other purpose, make sure you follow any state or federal wildlife laws in your area. Sure. It's nine foot eight. Looks like that'll work. We're looking for something between eight and twelve, right? Yep. Looks like there's a little brush in the middle we'll have to clear. Yep. Okay, so this tree is going to be our bait tree because you can see the main direction of the sun um, is pointing at that tree. And if we were to put the camera on it, we'd be getting too much glare from the sun on that. So we're looking for a tree that's about eight to 16 inches in diameter and you can see this one's looking like it's about oh 13 inches in diameter so this is a good size tree uh, for our purposes if we get much bigger than that then there's too much space between the gun brushes when the animal goes up the tree and if it's too small then it's just hard to get the uh, the bait to stay on the tree well so you want it to be a nice sturdy tree something that's not dead something that's not leaning too much. We also want to make sure that, you know, that there's no other small trees next to the bait tree because what animals will do is they'll climb the, the side trees and then jump, up, jump over to get the bait. So now with that we have our tree selected, the next step is a little bit of site preparation. You want to make sure there's no brush between the trees that could trigger the camera or block pictures of the animal going up the tree. So we're gonna wanna clear this brush in the bottom. And on the tree, we're gonna wanna make sure that the bait tree is basically just a pole. We're gonna wanna get rid of any resting branches for the animal because we don't want them resting on there or climbing there instead of climbing up and getting their hair on the gum brushes. And you also, if your tree has any kind of big hanging branches, you'll wanna remove them so they don't trigger the camera or block the view of the animal. So a good thing to do before you start hanging your bait is to have your GPS working on uh, gathering satellites and if it allows, averaging the waypoint. What you do is you just hit mark, you name your station, and if your GPS allows, you want to average the waypoint at least 80 times to get a really good location in case someone else checks your waypoint. You want to make sure to take your waypoint in the datum WGS84. So your bait should consist of a large hunk of wild game meat. Uh, Roadkill deer or elk work fine, skinned beavers work fine, but it's important that it be skinned. If it's not skinned, the animals will get hair all over your gun brushes and cause uh, contamination of the samples you're trying to collect. So you need to make a hole in your bait to slide your nine wire through so you can attach it to the tree. And the, and the nine wire should go around a major bone in the bait. So we want the bait to be about oh, 6 to 10 feet off the ground and that keeps uh, any predators that don't climb trees from eating the bait. What we are using here is a, is a hindquarter from a white-tailed deer and you want to make sure that you use only natural baits at these stations. So let's check and see if this is wired tight enough. Nope, it's moving. We need to wire more. There we go. So I took two additional wires and put them diagonally across the leg and cinched them down really tight so now the leg doesn't move and it'll take a lot of work for any animal to get this leg off the tree. So after you hang your bait, you're going to want to put gun brushes under the bait in order to collect hair and DNA from the animal. To connect the gun brush to the tree, you're going to use an electrical connector, which you're going to hammer in with a nail. And then the gun brush, which you're not going to touch with your bare hand, is going to go into the electrical connector. And you want to put them in two concentric circles, starting about 12 inches below the bait. You're going to have a total of 12 gun brushes on the bottom of the tree. So this is our finished product of our bait tree. 
You'll notice below the bait there aren't any gun brushes directly below the bait. This is really important because what happens is it'll warm up and the bait will leak. Blood will drip off of the bait and it'll contaminate the gun brushes. And it might seem odd, but actually what we find is animals often come behind the tree to get to the bait. So you're still going to get lots of hair from animals coming up the tree. You'll see we have a bait securely attached to the tree. We have our gun brushes. We have the station sign. And we also have a criminal tape going up and down the tree, which is basically just a piece of rope, and it has reflective tape every 12 inches, and that'll show up really well in night shots from our remote camera, uh, and it'll really help in, diff in, uh, in telling what type of animal is visiting the station. Sometimes it's tough to tell the difference between a marten and a fisher, for, exa and for example, and if we have a size estimate, it really helps us out. So what we've got here is our gusto sponge, and you want to hang this oh, for about 10 to 30 meters away from your bait station. The easiest way is to just dump it out in the snow and then, and then use your nine wire to poke a hole in it, like so. And once you got it kind of skewered on there, twist this. The idea is to put it in a place where it's really gonna catch the wind and get the scent out there. So we're going to pick a, try to get it up as high as you can and just flip your nine wire over a branch. Careful not to get it on you. I'm just going to twist that. The other thing you want to do is flag this tree so that you know where to find your gusto sponge again. This is one of the easiest things to forget when you're taking down a station. So when putting up your camera, the first thing you want to do is make sure that your, your, your camera tree is small enough to get your lock around. You also want to make sure your camera is going to be at the same height as your bait. We can adjust that in a second. Usually it's good enough to just use the camera lock to secure the camera to the tree. But if that doesn't work, you can also use a bungee cord. You also want to make sure that there's no branches above the camera tree above the camera that are going to get loaded down with snow and potentially block the view of the camera. Okay, so when we turn these cameras on, we're going to make sure that the memory card is empty and the batteries are charged. So we're going to scroll over to walk test. We're going to hit OK, and what the walk test is going to do is it's going to blink a red light every time the camera is triggered. So what this allows us to do is to go over to our bait tree and make sure that our camera is functioning properly and that it's, it's pointed at the right place. Basically, I'm just going to move my arm and wait to see the red light blink, letting me know that the camera detected that motion. So if your camera's not angled properly, you can always take a stick and just use it to kind of angle the camera down or up depending on what you you need it to do. We're also gonna just wave my arm up high and making sure that that camera is detecting this motion. So it looks good. One of the most important things to do at these bait stations is to fill out your data card and on the data card it's gonna have a place for uh, the date, who set it up, your location, the datum that you're using in your GPS unit which we prefer WGS 84 um, also, the, the distance between the bait and the camera trees, which in this case was 116. Um, make sure that that is between 96 and 144 inches uh, because these cameras are really sensitive to uh, distance. We're also going to put down what kind of camera we used um, and the serial number of the camera. Very important is the, the key number for the camera because uh, that you'll need that for going back to get these cameras off the tree. So a good thing to do before you leave is to flip this data sheet over and on the back we have a list of, of items, a checklist uh, for setting up these, these bait stations. And if you go through and you just check everything off of this list, then you, sh then you should be good to go. You, you will have done everything that you need to do to set these stations up correctly. So the last thing you want to do is arm the camera and there'll be under the main settings an option for arm camera. We're going to hit OK and it'll give you 10 seconds and you can see that this light's blinking. After 10 seconds the camera will be armed. So 
So I'm going to go over the steps for collecting your samples when you revisit a station. You'll be provided a card which has a protocol for rebating or removing the station. And just like on your setup, you want to go through this list and check off each item. If you check off each item, then you will have successfully uh, visited your site for a second time. Your data card will lead you through all the information that you need to record. You want to write your visit number. Usually that's going to be visit number two. Station number, in this case, is W11. You want to write your observer. So you write your last name. You want to write the date. You want to write the bait status. When you see your bait, it's either going to be untouched, it's going to be partially consumed with a little meat nibbled off of it, there will just be a skeleton or the bone left, or it's just going to be gone. So you're going to circle whichever one of these most accurately describes your bait. You'll have an action. You're either going to remove the station, you're going to rebait the station, or in any rare case where the bait was untouched, there would not be an action. So in this case, we're going to remove the station. For your sample IDs, what you're going to do is each gun brush that has hair on it is going to be collected and given a, state, a sample ID. Each gun brush without hair on it is not going to be collected in, an in a sample envelope. To name your sample ID, Every sample is going to start with W, then it's going to be the station number. So in this case, we'd have W11, and then each gun brush gets a letter. So the first gun brush you collect will be A, the second B, etc. And then you write your visit number, which will be V2, 3, or possibly more. So in this case, it's our second visit to station 11 and our first gun brush. So what I will name it is W11 for the station name, uh, A for the gun brush, then visit 2. So W11AV2. And as we collect more gun brushes, the only thing that would change is the letter A to B, C, etc. There's no particular gun brush that goes with a letter. It's just the first gun brush that you collect. So when you revisit your base station, what you're going to want to do is check each gun brush really carefully for any kind of hair. Take a look at this gun brush here, and you can't see any visible hair. In that case, we're not going to consider it a sample. If you rebate your station, you're just going to let it, let it stay the way it is. If you remove your station, you're going to just put it into a plastic bag and give it to the volunteer coordinator uh, to reuse later. So a good way to check for hair is to use your sample envelope as a backing. Sometimes when there's not much hair on a gun brush, you won't be able to see it well if it's backlit. So putting the sample envelope behind it lets you check for hair. So when you collect your gun brush, you never ever want to touch the hair. You don't want to contaminate the DNA. And it's important to have the gun brushes going in from the top. So when you remove, when you unscrew them, they don't fall into the snow. So this way, since the gun brush has gone into the connector from the top, we can just unscrew it and get it loose, and it just sits there and doesn't fall. And then I can just take my sample envelope and never touch it, just kind of grab it like that, pull it out, and shake it into an envelope. What you can do then, you can go ahead and put just a little bit of moisture on the envelope and seal it. And you're going to want to have the envelope pre-filled out with all this information. You want the sample ID, you want the latitude, the longitude, you don't need to fill in the cell number, you need to fill in the date, any observers that were present, and, the, uh, and you don't need to fill in the species, because we won't know that until we have the DNA extracted. When you're transporting your samples out of the field, they're going to be moist, and that's okay, but just throw them all into a Ziploc bag and keep them in a safe compartment of your pack. As soon as you get out of the field, you want to want to make sure these samples are dried. So, if you're not able to get them to the volunteer coordinator immediately, what you're going to want to do is get them out of the plastic. And you're going to want to put them in a, in, a, in a room temperature dry place. Some place that pets can't access them, like cats or dogs. Some place like a drawer in a warm room works great. Just lie them out individually and let them dry. The DNA will stay act, will stay fine if it's dry, but if it's wet, the DNA gets denatured. De uh, really quickly, so it's imperative that the samples be dried quickly and remain dry. When the bait station is being removed for the final time, you want to make sure to leave no trace and leave no hardware at the station. 